as we sit down for Bible study tonight. I sure hope you've had a, an excellent day in the Lord and that uh, with anticipation you look to uh, joining us for our uh, Bible study tonight. Uh, we are uh, still back in the book of Matthew. I think we're going to fill out some more, flesh out some more of the uh, place of the word as it applies to uh, the season we're coming out of, which is Passover, the, over uh, the season we're headed into of, of uh, Shavuot. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's just exciting to get in the word. I, I think anytime you can open the word of God, uh, there's, there's meat in there, there's new discoveries to make. But uh, most importantly, the, the time of the word is a time for two things. It's a time for uh, fellowshipping with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that when we sit down, this is an opportunity for Holy Spirit to, to bring things across our uh, attention in just a different venue in, than maybe normally uh, would, would happen. Uh, but it's also a time for fellowshipping as, as family. And you say, Pastor, what do you mean fellowshipping as family? We're scattered, we're off in our separate homes and everything. Anytime you gather around the Word of God, there is a, there's a sense of fellowship. Uh, the Holy Spirit who is leading and guiding you through tonight, leading and guiding me through tonight, uh, is, is got a message to bring us all through. And even though we'll each have a different piece of that message, uh, there will be a sense in our spirit, man, that uh, we've been communing together, we've been fellowshipping together, we've we've gone to class together. It's it's kind of like going to a uh, you know a high school college class or something where you you know especially if it's after work you've been working all day you run off to college you're taking an evening class you may not have that much time to talk with the other people there because you're there for class but there's sense a sense of camaraderie that you're. You're even uh, taking the class together. Uh, one of the values I believe that Holy Spirit had in telling us not to forsake our assembling together uh, was precisely that, uh, that we, we assemble together and now, again, whether we've talked or not, we've had a common purpose, a shared, uh, a shared experience through the evening, and uh, that brings us together corporately. Uh, as family, and when when people believe that somehow we we don't need corporate worship, we can you know I can worship by myself on the golf course kind of thing. Uh, we we miss a piece of what Yahweh's plan is uh, when the church was designed to revolve around uh, the preaching and teaching of His Word. So uh, so let's back up and uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the background of things we've been going over in the preceding weeks as we've been talking about the place of, of Torah in the life of a believer, and so appropriate that here we are in this journey from Passover to Sukkot, uh, to, I mean, Shavuot, that, um, that, that we have this time when we're actually in Yeshua's teaching on Torah. And, of course, once we get beyond Shavuot, then we'll be on to other things for Bible study, but we'll still be moving forward uh, in terms of the, the Moeds. Uh, so, so the premise that we've been operating on is that Yeshua did not come to do away with the Torah. Uh, he came to make it full of meaning. If, it, if any day... Thing, Yeshua came to give the Torah more meaning, deeper meaning. Uh, if, if you think it was tough the way you read it, way do you read it the way uh, Yeshua reads it, because he takes it out of the outward manifestation, out of the outward performance, and places the Torah smack dab in the middle of the heart where it belongs, so that our living out of a Torah Christian life uh, is are we being obedient to the Torah from the law? And that's been the thrust. And, and so when we came to the very familiar uh, Our Father's 
prayer, the Lord's Prayer, uh, the interesting aspect that Yeshua brought to it is this, that he's not hung up on how we should pray. Um, he, he's, he's, he's going to go after, I mean, he's not hung up on what you should pray, but how you should pray. Uh, uh, again, he, he's after attitude. Uh, there is an attitude that Yahweh, Abba Yahweh, is attempting to build within the people of God in the wilderness. And so he's got to get him out of a slave mentality uh, into a family mentality to shift them from, again, asking the question, what's, what's in my head, but what, what's in my heart? And the uh, focus then becomes that Yahweh is our Father. It, it's not God in the sky. It's not deity somewhere. It's not Elohim among many Elohims. But it's Abba Yahweh, the way he introduced him to Moses and told him to introduce himself to the people, I'm Yahweh, um, that we are to pray with a consciousness that it is our Father uh, whose location is in heaven and that all prayer is to be bathed in the hallowness of his name, the holiness of his name. Now, let, let's step back and, and, and consider that for a moment. That if he's our father in heaven, and if as we see in a moment, we've already seen that heaven is both, it's bilocational. Uh, it's in, the, in the quantum world, it's residing in two realms simultaneously. Uh, that heaven is a fact of the dimension that we call earth, and a dimension, um, another dimension entered through a portal that the people would call heaven itself. But that, that our Father is bilocational, which means that he's, he's a resident of heaven and he's a resident of the kingdom on earth simultaneously. Now, this, this will be helpful for, for you when you realize that the, the religious world tries to put you in one place or the other. Uh, Christianity, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. You know, that, that somehow or other there's a lack of reality to this world. So, so the, the, one of the great divides between uh, Judaism and Christianity is... Where's your home? And what's your job? And what are, you, what are you about in Yahweh's plan for creation? And, and for many people, home has become heaven, a place in the future. For most religion, it's that way. Irregardless of the religion, Christian or otherwise, uh, that the destination is heaven, a place in the future. Anything here is kind of cheap and short and, and uh, doesn't quite measure up to all that, uh, that Yahweh would have for us. And therefore, in Christianity, we have a real uh, uh, split whereby heaven, listen to me, he he heaven becomes an otherworldly place. And therefore, Christians are taught to be otherworldly. So the ultimate goal of a, a Christian is to be an otherworldly Christian, be a monk in a monastery, whatever. Um, and that anything to do with this world, and an extreme within Christianity, anything to do with this world is somehow secular, uh, profane, uh, and 
when we come to read the Bible through those eyes, we start misinterpreting. So, for example, when Paul tells us to come out from among them, be separate, we end up with a view that anything that is secular or worldly has got to be um, satanic almost. Whereas in Judaism, they have a very uh, integrative approach to what heaven is. Heaven is here. And that lines up so much with what Yeshua said. Um, you know, the kingdom of heaven is here and now. Uh, the kingdom of God is among you, here and now. So there's a, there's a real sense that you find relationship uh, with Yahweh in the church by going, uh, separating yourself to, to the point where you don't even deal with the world and you have no context with the world. You have no obligation to the world. You, you have no sense of responsibility to the world. Your only sense of responsibility is I've got to win people to Christ. Uh, whereas in Judaism, there is a high sense of responsibility to the world mixed up in the word tikkun olam. Tikkun olam. And, and so... For a Jew to live faithfully to Yahweh, according to the Bible, they're going to be in the process of repairing the world, making what's broken better, fixing what's wrong, uh, a high sense of responsibility to community, to family, uh, to one's brother, one's sister, and, and there, thereby ends up a split that secularizes or religiousizes, I can't make that a word, I suppose, uh, turns into a religion that which is meant to be relationship. And we're going to look at, at that in a specific way uh, just in a minute here. So he goes on and says then that, that our praying is to be how well, we should be praying to our Father in heaven, we should be praising his name, uh, we should be looking for his kingdom to come and working for that, at the same time we should be working for his will to be done, on earth as it is in heaven, which means there should be no dichotomy between heaven and earth regarding the will of God. Uh, everything that is truly uh, holy, is truly godly, is truly in the world, but not of the world. So the verse I want to focus on uh, with you for the moments that we have here this evening, verse 10, excuse me, verse 11. A simple little part of the prayer that says, give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. And, and how can you be in the middle of Passover season and not, uh, not recognize what it's talking about? Not seeing the prime evidence of an illustration of daily bread. You know the story there of the Israelites out in the uh, wilderness complaining about we don't have meat, we don't have water, we don't have, you know, we have bread. And they get, Yahweh keeps finding water for them, producing water for them. And, and then the quail come for the bread. But the big one is the manna. To, to, when you ask me why I think the big one's the manna, it's become, it, it comes every day. Every, every day, uh, there's fresh manna being produced on the grounds of the desert six days a week because Yahweh is honoring the Sabbath, so uh, he's going to provide on Friday enough to cover for them to cover for two days. Uh, but I think that when Yeshua said, you need to be praying, give us today our daily bread, that immediately that triggered in all of their minds Passover and triggered manna. manna. I mean, they were living off manna at that time and they continued to live off manna 
right up until they entered the promised land. So uh, water was provided, manna was provided, quail was provided, their shoes did not wear out. Uh, Yahweh, as an uh, absolutely awesome father, uh, took care of his children all through that wilderness journey, even during their rebellion and disobedience. Glory to God. But what does that question about give us today? What, what, why, is, why is Yeshua asking us or telling us, directing us, to enter into a personal relationship with Abba Yahweh, the creator of the universe, and, and the center in praying of all the things you could pray for. Center in praying to the Father is a relationship that invokes daily bread. Is this literally about man? It, it could be. I'm sure, I'm sure that's a part of it. But is it possible that there's something more uh, that when we let go of Torah, we be began to let go of some Torah teachings that were important, vital, I would say, for keeping us in a proper connection with our Father in Heaven. Now, uh, I think the answer is yes. And I think it speaks right to our culture today. This is not the prayer most of us pray in our movements. This is, we all say, well, we say the Lord's Prayer for in a liturgical church, we say it all the time. And we think liturgically, we think, okay, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Do we really mean that? What, what, what have we dropped when we drop daily bread? Now think about it. Judaism is a, is a, is a cultural culture richly steeped in the breaking of bread together. Uh, a tradition we've long dropped in, 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 in the church. Every meal begins with a blessing over the bread. Every, as a matter of fact, in gatherings, they'll break bread and say a blessing over the bread before they go ahead and have their conference meeting or whatever they're doing, the, the center place of, of bread. We have seen the church shift to a point where theologically we might agree with daily bread, but in reality, we haven't begun to understand Paul met when he said, I've learned to be content uh, in whatever situation I'm in. And so in Far too many, uh, again, camps and uh, churches in our camp, it's, it's, I don't want today's bread, I want tomorrow's bread. Uh, I, I don't want enough to get me by today, I want pressed down, shaken together, running over and pouring out. Now, is that true? You're going to get, you can get pressed down, shaken together. Yes, absolutely truth. Uh, but, we're being taught to pray for that which would meet our requirements now. And then requirements grow as we realize that part of our requirements are to be a giver. We've been talking about that. So now we need to give. So we need because we need, then we need because, uh, because we need to help others. Come on. And it's smack dab sitting in the middle of the, of the Torah prayer. Give us today our daily bread. Now that means on one hand, you should never fall short. That's a good message. I like that message. You should never fall short. It's legitimate to come to the Father praying for, uh, with confidence and decreeing and declaring that all our needs are met. Uh, so... What, what I need today is met.
But you notice what was required in the manna was what they needed that day, except on these special times when they had stored up. And there were other storage times, a lot of storage times uh, in the scriptures where you, you, uh, you were to set something aside for use at a latter time. And, you know, when, when I look at the, the scripture, it, it's like it's neon lights flashing there. Uh, unfortunately, it's been used as a verse uh, to say that Christians shouldn't have anything. You should be broke. Well, I don't see broke in there anyway. Uh, my daily bread doesn't include brokenness. If, I, if, if I'm broke, I don't, I don't have daily bread. But on the other hand, I should never have to fear about storing up and saving for a rainy day because it's very clearly saying each day I should be, have an expectation that my needs for that day are, are, are present. All my needs are met. All my needs are always met. So we err on two ditches. You know, we don't see the need met, so we worry. On the other hand, you know, we, uh, uh, we try to store up, you know, extra for what? Extra for what? And, you know, listening to a lot of the financial testimonies and everything from uh, those who've taken the word of God at face value, uh, you know, it's exciting to me when I hear the stories where the suddenlies are there. You know, people just got their eyes off of circumstances. And when they, um, when it was needed, it was there. I was listening to a Brother Keith Moore talk about, a, I think this was a pretty recent convention they had. And they raised enough money in the convention to meet some major projects they had in line. And uh, it, was, it was exciting to both Keith and Phyllis, and they were sharing how the day after the convention, they're just, you know, praising God for all that. And, um, you know, ask the Lord, the, 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 the church there, Faith Life Church, and Branson had an a, a, a extra building. It was one of their early church buildings, and they, when they grew bigger and bigger, they just unable to sell that one. And they always wondered why they couldn't sell that building. Just, they just couldn't seem to sell that building. And they'd be putting projects together, and they'd think, well, we can sell that building they can pay for that project, but they were unable to sell the building. And he said, uh, that day, uh, after the convention, they were looking at the numbers and everything and said, we can now complete every single project. So now the building isn't needed. And it suddenly hit them, Holy Spirit hit them, I'm sure, that the reason the building couldn't sell was... Holy Spirit did not want them relying on something they could see, namely property they already had. They had to believe God for that project. And having believed and seen the money came in, now the project, the building itself was now free to be sold uh, to do whatever the Lord might lead them to do. And he was talking about how easy it is to get dependent on the fact that we have stored up for the future. We're like super squirrel. <laughs> We're like super squirrel. We, we've saved up enough nuts to get through the winter and halfway through the spring. Uh, the, the, the challenge of believing for and receiving, believing for and receiving and then beginning to store away what you've received so you no longer need to believe. Are you following me in this? I, I used to put it this way. I, I can remember as a, as a young pastor, uh, of course the, the economics were different then, but not, not ever imagining what it would be like to have a $100 bill <laughs> or have $500 in the bank. And, and I remember the first time I, I, I had... $500 in the bank, and boy, I was really excited. I mean, that, that was a lot of money to me then, and, and it was like exciting to, uh, you know, to have that kind of 
kind of money available, you know, that beyond my budget, budget's all taken care of and I got $500 sitting there. Um, and I discovered something that when, when the Lord would ask me, I'd get to that point and I'd say, give away 100, give away 200. Because I had 500 in the bank, I was very willing to give away one, two, three hundred dollars. Pretty soon I got to the point where I had a thousand. And now it was more challenging to give away, let's say, six hundred dollars because I had come to rely upon it. And, and it's uh, so I, I developed this phrase you trust God plus. I trust God plus a number in the bank. I trust God as long as I have 500 at the bank. I trust God as long as I have 1,000 in the bank. I trust God as long as I have 10,000 in the bank. And the challenge is that number keeps growing in terms of what I can feel comfortable. And so when I've got a certain amount in the bank, I can, I can give a certain amount beyond that. And, and as it goes up, what I can give goes up, but it never goes back. So where $500 would have been a real stretch, $500 should be easy now, but I'm stretching as much because I've come to rely on it. I'm comfortable. If things go bad, at least I got 500 in the bank. If things go bad, I got at least 1,000 in the bank. If I lose my job, I've got at least 10,000 in the bank. You know, we all have these figures that Dave Ramsey's and others gives us. And what we're really doing is building up a trust God plus. I no longer just trust him to give it all away. But what about giving it all away? You know, I came in with nothing. You end up going out with nothing. You're not behind the game. And I have found that that's challenging to people's thinking, but it's because we, we do. We do readily get uh, latched onto, attached to, uh, held by uh, the living beyond today. Living already counting our pennies in next, next week's bank. And yet Yeshua said, the prayer is this. This is the attitude. Give us today, give us today our daily bread. It's an, it's an attitude of gratitude. It's an attitude of satisfaction. Again, as Paul said, I know how to live if I have a lot, and I know how to live if I don't have that much at all because I've learned the secret of being content. And the secret of contentment, therefore, when I look at that, if the, if, if the secret of contentment is wrapped up in that, then contentment is learning to live what today provides for you. Hmm. Seems to me we can teach a lot of our children that, you know, in terms of, well, what else is there to eat? <laughs> I want something else to eat. The... But we are talking about food. You've got to think it in terms of food. I think of children in Haiti who have one meal a day and are very happy to have that. Have a lot of gratitude for their one meal a day. And how many children in America have total lack of gratitude when you get three meals a day? Well, what about spiritually speaking? You know, we have more spiritual food in America than just about anywhere else. Tapes, books, iPods, C-pads, you know, Twitter, I don't even know them all. Facebook, should say that we're using it. Uh, things we have by which we can walk in a world surrounded by the Word of God. And yet, how, how many Christians, number one, don't know it's there? Number two, how many Christians know, don't know how to use it if they knew it was there? And number three, how many Christians uh, couldn't tell the good food from the bad food? 
you know, we're, we are an overfed spiritual generation in America. But I'm not sure that that necessarily has made us more content. So when Yeshua is saying, give us our daily bread, he's asking you and I to make a very conscientious decision about how we change the focus of our life. I remember uh, years ago being in, in a, a church board meeting in my first uh, denominational church here in New England and there was a pretty heavy discussion going on. I hadn't been there that long, so I didn't, you know, really know the dynamics behind everybody's comments and everything. But after the meeting, there was a, an older woman there. Well, older. <laughs> she was probably in her uh, 50s at the time. And uh, she said to me, she said, Pastor, can, can I chat with you for a minute? I said, sure. She said, you know, my, my father was a, a, a pastor. I said, yeah, I had heard that. And she said, and I always heard him giving this piece of advice to, to young pastors. I thought I'd pass, pass it on to you. He said, when you get in church meetings, people can get kind of uptight about their issue, whether the issue is how much money is being spent on new carpets for the church, whether they're going to get a new sign out front, what the pastor's salary is going to be, all kinds of things they can get involved in. And she said, Here's what he told me. He said, when you're in a meeting like that and, and, a, and an issue comes up, ask yourself this one question. Will this question be important uh, one year from now? If it will, you need to fight for it for all you've got. Uh, if it's only going to be important six months from now, be willing to change and let someone else have their way. <laughs> and it wasn't, but a couple of months later, I'm, I'm in a board meeting with this woman, and uh, there's another one of the, this was a pretty contentious church. There was a um, board meeting going on, and uh, some decision had to be made, and I was pushing one way, and some people wanted another way, and suddenly I, 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 looked over at her and she just kind of smiled at me and I stopped and I thought of her question and I said to her Ruth this will not be important in three minutes let alone six she laughed I laughed nobody knew what was going on but vote went the other way but three months later things changed again and uh, and she was right you got to deal with today with today's issues. And don't be asking for tomorrow's issues to be solved today when they might not even be here when it comes tomorrow. I, I hope that's been helpful to you to, to kind of sort through some things. Well, it should because uh, too many of us are either focused on stale moldy bread of the past or we're waiting for fresh bread from heaven for tomorrow when we're not getting out of today what we need to get out of out of today. Amen? That help you some? Glory to God. All right. Now, when Yeshua moves on with this, th this now takes place. Put, put verse 11 back into verse 10. Verse 10, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, Bert. Verse uh, 9, excuse me. Verse 10, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the context of daily bread, then we find that the kingdom of Yahweh is a daily kingdom. Again, that doesn't mean you don't plan for the future. It doesn't mean you, you don't uh, look at the, the future. It doesn't, doesn't mean you evaluate your past. It just means that the kingdom of God is a today kingdom. It's here and now. Why, why, why should that surprise us? It's a here and now kingdom. 
What, what's Yahweh want here and now? What is Abba doing here and now? What is Holy Spirit guiding us into here and now? What, what, what are the decisions we need to make here and now so that the here and now and the, rich, the richness of the here and now and the fullness of the here and now doesn't get robbed because we're uh, moaning over the past or we're worried about the future. That kind of past and that kind of future do not belong in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a here and now kingdom. So I get up every morning entering the kingdom of God here and now. I go to work every day uh, in the kingdom that is here and now. I, I deal with the issue on the phone that is here and now. I deal with the issue in the email here and now. I, I'm living in a here and now kingdom with great expectation that the answers to the here and now question are here and now which requires me, therefore, to develop a here and now relationship with Yahweh. All of that to get around to that. Yahweh doesn't want a I was relationship or I will be relationship, but I am. Throughout this wilderness journey, opening up the understanding of the Israelites to his nature, I am Yahweh Rapha, as I am, I am something. Not I was, not I will be, but I, but I am. Now, I, I am includes I was and I will be, but the primary motivator for uh, 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 an exciting, alive relationship is that it's a, uh, I'm here and now. I'm here and now. I'm here and now. Daily bread, daily bread, daily bread, daily bread. Matter of, 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 of constant day after day after day after day. Uh, going through the same connection. You are my daily bread. You are my connection, Yahweh. You are my connection, Yeshua. You are my connection, Holy Spirit. Not, I haven't seen you in three days or I'm going to see you next week. No, you're a daily, 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 daily connection. Glory to God. And so the, the uh, kingdom now gets tied in the Lord's Prayer to not just that the kingdom not only has a king who happens to be our father, whose name is to be hallowed, but whose kingdom can be aided, assisted, and abetted as it comes into this world and that, that you and I can do our part to, to see that, that the connection is made. I'm living kingdom. I'm living kingdom. You need to uh, listen to some of uh, Terry Mize's uh, messages with uh, Kenneth uh, Copeland and, uh, and George Pearson's as a, more George Pearson's as a, talk about this um, as, as uh, Terry talks about wanting as a young man to live the kingdom, not just to have ideas about it, but, but to, to live it. He, he, he didn't want to learn doctrines. He didn't want to be a, a, a churchman, but he wanted to embrace and live out. What does it mean to live the kingdom? And therefore, he has amazing results in his life of things that are absolutely miraculous that, that Yahweh through Holy Spirit accomplished in his life and is still doing so. Um, why? Because he, he, wanted, he wanted to live the kingdom, not teach the kingdom. He wanted the kingdom to be a part of his living and breathing. So if he's you know, traipsing around Mex Mexico and there's people shooting at him and trying to kill him, that kingdom principles work in his, you know, well-known story about the bandit that threatened to murder him was going to rob him and you know and how that story worked out it, it, amazing things amazing things but he made a decision i want the kingdom to be lived in my life not just taught i i, I want to be able to live out the principle 
You're, you're living that way because that's how the kingdom works. That's how, that's how you actually live the kingdom of God. And, and so this joining together then of bringing our Father in heaven by having his kingdom come and his will be done on earth, that's the focus of our prayer. We're, we're, we're decreeing and declaring on our part of the kingdom that it, that it becomes part of what we're experiencing here and that his will be done, that in that context then we come to verse 12 where he says, pray this, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Do you see how this is building on, on top of each other? We, we can't run in and say, Abba Yahweh, forgive me my debts, but he's not Father in heaven. We're not praying for the kingdom to come. We're not seeking to live by kingdom principles. We're not trying to live day by day, but we want to store it up and keep it, and we're getting greedy. Well, then when it comes to questions of forgiveness operating in our life, uh, and how temptation is overcome in our life, these things fall short of the power that they're meant to have because we have failed to comprehend and embrace a very, very Jewish teaching, Torah teaching, the Lord's Prayer. Isn't that amazing? And so throwing out Torah, getting rid of Torah, has, has great uh, danger to it. It has, uh, unfortunately, a great loss of truth and understanding comes when we step outside of that which our forefathers knew and grabbed hold of pagan things from a pagan world which had nothing to do with Torah itself. In the last verses there, uh, uh, last two verses, 14 and 15, for if you forgive others people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wow. That's a kind of heavy to put at the end of a prayer. It is all about our relationship with our Father, uh, how, to, uh, how to get tight with Him, how to bring the kingdom in. But I think there's a vital point to it. Because all of the Lord's Prayer is about establishing prayer that works, prayer that is effective, prayer that is Torah-based. And we've studied with Yeshua over the past months now that Torah has requirements. And so here are our requirements. If you, if you want to be forgiven, you got to forgive. This is reciprocity right away. If you want to forgive, then you've got to be the forgiver. Your heavenly Father's eager and quick to forgive you, but if you're not forgiving others, that creates a roadblock uh, beyond which it's, it's difficult and challenging for a person to walk free in the kingdom of God. Amen? So, so let's, let's consider this daily thing again from another thing. Psalm 68, 19, if you, if you happen to have your Bible there, Psalm 68, 19, David writes this. Praise be to Yahweh, the God, uh, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. That's in the King James. Praise be to Yahweh our God, our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Contemporary English Bible, Bible paraphrases it. We praise you, Lord God. You treat us with kindness day after day. And you rescue us day after day. Wow. If you read through the Psalms, and I encourage you to do, do, do it with this in mind, looking for the daily interventions. Uh, how daily David says, I come, come into the temple. Daily I sit at your feet. Daily you... Uh, you know, you have your arms of protection around me. Um, the Psalms is filled with a revelation of the image of, of, of um, King David 
as a man who had an ongoing daily relationship. The minute I hear that, I jump back to Genesis uh, chapter 1, 2, and say, well, wasn't that the way it was supposed to be? Uh, Yahweh walked with uh, Adam and Eve in the pool of the day. There was a sense of daily fellowship. In fact, when sin entered the garden is when you had that first sense of, of brokenness uh, in relationship. Uh, before that, there's just a daily communion going on between Adam and Eve and, and God. And uh, he knew it when the relationship got broken and, and they knew it as well. But we jump over into the Psalms, and again, we find over and over that morning after morning, morning after morning, night after night, day after day, these phrase, phrases of a um, regular rhythm, a, a regular rhythm that God wanted to be in with his people. He wanted to be able to speak to them and fellowship with them. On a, uh, on, a, uh, on a regular basis. And the question is, what is regular? And the answer is very simple. Regular is however two people want to define it. You know, we have regular board meetings at our at our church. How often do you have them? Once a year. Most churches have them maybe every quarter, four times a year. You get in a mega church and they're going to have uh, regular meetings every week. Every week regular meetings are going on uh, to carry on the life in, in, in relationship of the church. And so, so when you're in the Psalms, you're picking up a flavor. Remember where we started out? With the Lord's Prayer, he's not in, interested in teaching you um, uh, what to pray, but how to pray. And prayer should be part, therefore, of a regular dialogue. Regular can be frequently, but quickly. You can meet once a week for an hour. You can meet every day for five minutes. You know, uh, it, it, it's, do you want little catch-up meetings? Do you want a long meeting? What do you want? Uh, but the concept, again, of, of God wants to engage with us daily. Now, my question is, how does he want to engage with us? And too often within, within Christian circles or images, God wants to meet us every single day because he's a hard taskmaster. Uh, he, he's he's going to come and take the lap of the, 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 the rod of instruction and correct us, and that's all he wants to do. It's God on the phone. Oh, no. But again, like Psalm 68, 19 again, pray, praise be to, to, to the Lord our God, our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Yahweh is a loving, compassionate Father who is looking to and fro to demonstrate himself strong in your success, who is looking constantly for ways to speak encouragement into your life. He is, he is a, a, a God who wants to daily come right alongside you and carry what you aren't meant to carry. He's not a God sitting there with his arms folded, looking at you, saying, well, he, he, he's, he's a God who's looking to, he's looking to find uh, things that will be encouraging to you. Can he find things that are not encouraging? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, they're there. Does that mean he's never going to speak to you about this? Oh, no, 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 no. But the point is, what, what, what you find in the Psalms is he's constantly calling himself a God of compassion, a God of forgiveness, a, a, a God who removes sin as far as east is from west, a God who's in favor of your success. 
Come on. Come on. And this on a daily base, basis. This is not, you know, I get my one shot to talk to the Rebbe every 10 years and, and I go down to 770 in Brooklyn and, and have my meeting with him. No, 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 no. This is a revelation right in the middle of Yahweh's word that not only is he in favor of your success, he's, he's trying to get alongside of you to bear, uh, to bear your burdens, to help carry the weight, and he, and he wants to do that on a regular basis. So my question, how's your regular time doing? How's your regular time doing with, with, with not just the word, when you hear the word, I hope you're listening to the word, but when you hear the word, are you hearing him speak? If you have a, a, a cassette, CD, iPod playing in the nighttime, do you wake up in the nighttime and the words of it are, are refreshing to you and, 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 and pulling on something in your spirit, man, and, and quickening you and, and making you alive? See, our, our relationship is meant to be that. The Torah relationship is not God is a judge under the Torah, but under the New Testament, he's, he's sweet, nice, and kind. That's not it at all. There are commandments, rules, and regulations under the Brit Hadashah just as surely as under the, under the Torah. But Yahweh is just as much, if not more so, a father uh, under the Torah as he ever was uh, under in any of the books of the of the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament. And as as Torah, as Christians who are trying to be a Torah observant, who are trying to take the word of Yahweh, which he never negated, never put away, and to apply their relevance to our life today, uh, we need to become familiar with the God of Abraham. Isaac and Jacob, the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We need to walk in a more Torah family observance. For surely if, surely if Torah was anything, it was family. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You don't find lineages like that in the, in the uh, Brit Hadashah in the New Testament. We, we've been invited to join a family, not just of, hey, brother, hey, sister, in a New Testament sense. But we have been invited to join into a family that is truly a covenant family. A, a, a family that, that has a covenant that will last forever, that God said he would never break and never give up. And we're in the season where we're celebrating that covenant as we have left Egypt and we're on our way to Canaan land. And even though that generation messed up and didn't get there, the next one got in, and that's been the story on and on and continues to be. And even now, Yahweh's still bringing them back home and still will right up to the end until finally, you know, there is just one solid family through all eternity. That's the family we're part of. That's what this prayer is about. We're praying to our covenant father, our covenant father, who will never forsake us, never leave us, never fail on one of his promises, will always be there for us. Well, I trust you got something out of this tonight. Uh, next week, we'll uh, be back here again, having a great time in the Word of God. You live your life as a covenant man, covenant daughter of, his, of the Most High God, and you change your world in the name of Yeshua.